Welcome back. I'm Connie Sobel, your host of Call to Create, and we are so happy to have a fabulous, well-known, best-selling author with us today, Scott Savage. Scott, so nice to have you with us. Thank you. It's so great to be here. It's been a while since we've talked, and, and I always love the opportunity. Absolutely adore him. We see each other at writers' conferences, and I just love him and his wife. I usually see him in Macy's at the grocery store. Right. They lived in my area. So delighted to have you today. And if you are an author or speaker, writer, any kind of artistic expression, this, this is the thing for you to know some tips and tools of how to move forward on your journey that can be ups and downs and all the things. But we're going to talk to him today about how he can be such a prolific author, produce so much great stuff and still be able to keep family first and family involved and be able to have the sort of full complete life and not just be, I'm at the top of the heap and don't you all wanna be like me too. So we're gonna give you the official bio today. He is the author of 20 published novels. He's been a teacher and presenter at writing conferences for adults and youth. And I have it on full authority that people say, when he keynotes go, it's worth the price of admission just for that, just so you know. <laughs> And also, he's developed Common Core Aligned projects for elementary school writing curricula. He has presented at more than 3,000 schools across the country, and I imagine that's counting as well. Inspiring students to read, write, and embrace their own creativity and change the world. He is represented by Michael Barrett of Distel, Goderich, and Barrett. And he is also the author of the recent release, Grace and Fox and the Treasure of Principal Redbeard, as well as the Lost Wonderland Diary series published by Shadow Mountain. Case File 13 Middle Grade Series, published by Harper Collins, and the Far World and Mysteries of Cove Middle Grade Fantasy Series, both published by Shadow Mountain. That's a mouthful. Lastly, he lives <laughs> in Utah with his wife of 35 years, Jennifer, who I adore and who is literally, they are two peas in a pod. You cannot say him and Jennifer without saying both of them in the same thing, in the same sentence. He has four amazing children and nine perfect grandchildren and enjoys reading after all of this and travel and camping with his family. All right, let's get into the scoops. I have to know, what made you first write your very first book? What was it that made you actually put pen to paper, which is something so many people want to do, but what was it that motivated that? So um, in looking back, I knew I wanted to be a writer for a long time, um, but I didn't know that I could be an author. I think there's a difference where a lot of us sort of you know, we have this dream that's kind of on a pedestal and it's like, that's, I could never do that, but how cool would it be? You know, what, whatever that might be. And so literally, and, and a lot of authors, I think, experienced this. It was a time of, of a lot of stress. I was the CEO of an internet company that literally we sold this seven month old company. We were in New York, sold the company for over a hundred million dollars one day. And the very next day, the market crashed, the deal completely fell apart. And so I was suddenly on planes talking to investors, potential purchasers, our current investors. And just as a way of stress relief, I started writing kind of a high-tech thriller. And, and I would write a few chapters. My sister, Deanne, would read it and go, hey, this is great. Are you going to write more? And and when I got done, she said, well, you know, I love this. You need to publish it. And I was like, I would have no idea how to do that. And she pushed me toward Covenant Communications, a small Utah publisher. I sent it to them. And six months later, they called and said, hey, we want to publish this. And I've had lots of rejections. And, you know, you talk about how, like, like kind of getting this dream, you have all these rejections. I started with the first acceptance and then had a lot of different rejections afterwards. But that was the process was really just a way to relieve stress. That is incredible. And did you find that it started to flow or were you having to stop and start and learn skills? Or did you feel like it just started to come out in the doing? I think there are a lot of things that I would have done differently with that story now. I, I go back and I like the story, but I would write it very differently with what I know now. But at the time, because there were no aspirations of getting it published, I didn't know enough to know what I was doing wrong and right. So so it really did just kind of flow and, and come out for better or for worse. <laughs> I think it's, I, it makes me think of scrapbooking. You always think it's so beautiful. And then 10 years later, you look back, you're like, what was I thinking? Right. right. You just want to go back that's, and fix it. Yeah. But I think, honestly, I think that's the way with life with a lot of things, you know, we're like, yeah, 
I, I didn't know a lot of things back when I was younger, but I had the, the energy and the enthusiasm. And looking back, I'm glad I did those things because I never would have learned the things that I learned now without making some of those mistakes. Exactly. And what step out of the steps of whatever you're creating, even the creation of the world, right? What step would you say, well, no, maybe I go back and do that. Too, right? They're all the most important step for you to get to the next important step. So that's it's right. Beautiful. That's exactly it. So when that started to take off, did you feel like, I think I can do this for a living? Or did you feel like this is still a side hustle like that? I don't want to tell anybody about this. Well, again, I was so naive that when I published my first book, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm an author. I'm going to quit the high tech world. I'm going to go buy a cabin by the lake, you know? Yeah. And then I saw my first royalties and it was like, oh, no, I guess I won't do that. <laughs> In fact, from a financial standpoint, I think that, again, that if I if I had had to rely on the finances of being a writer for most of the first 20 years that I wrote, I, I would have quit. I had a person one time in my ward who came up to me and was a business guy. I'd done a lot of stuff. And he's like, well, so how much do you make per book? You know, this, I mean, really pretty blunt, but I was like, well, about this much. And he goes, and how long does it take you to make a book? And I told him, and he's like, why do you do that? You know, and, and I thought about that. But then later on, I went back to him and I'm like, you know, you do all these scouting events. Like you've been a scout leader forever but you don't make any money from that. So why do you do that? You know, and he kind of backed up and went, okay, yeah, I can see that. And I think most creative endeavors, like you never want to tell someone, hey, you can't make a living at this because you can make a living at any creative endeavor, but you've got to start doing it because you love it because most creative people are not making enough money to live off of it. And oftentimes it's combining it with something else or a different approach or, and that's what you've done. Let's kind of scoot to that as you're writing more of these books, you have been a genius at marketing this, of being able to reach your target market, this middle grade, you know, kind of group of, of kids. And you've done the school assemblies and 3000 schools and all that. Tell us how that genesis got started. I, again, you know, we talk about mistakes, right? So I started writing adult books, didn't think I could write kids' books, eventually discovered that that was, to me, sort of my calling, was, was writing middle grade fantasy. And my very first middle grade book came out literally within months. You know how I talk about, I started writing in a recession. Uh, I started writing for kids in another recession. So the publisher, Shadow Mountain, had been doing these big tours, all this big stuff. And then right when my book came out, there was a recession, um, all the Borders bookstores closed, all the publishers did layoffs, and and Shadow Mountain at that time said, you know, hey, we had these big plans, we're, we're not going to, we don't even know really if you're going to be able to do a book too. And the tech company that I was working for said, you know, hey, we're, we're reorganizing some things, we've got some new ownership we're going to be doing some layoffs. Would you be interested in taking severance and doing this? And so in my mind, again, because I didn't know, I looked like I saw things that like Brandon Mole and, and other authors had done that were touring. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And so I took the severance and I knew I couldn't tour across the US, but I could tour in Utah thinking, all right, I'll sell all these books. And then the publisher will say, well, gosh, let's give you a really big advance for the next one. It didn't happen. In fact, really, to me, that was sort of like a failure. I mean, by the end of the year, we had debt that we'd accrued. You know, I, I had four fairly young kids all at home. I'd spent, you know, Jen and I were, my wife and I were touring a lot. And then the publisher came back and they're like, well, that was great, but we don't even know that we're going to do a book too. Looking back though, what felt like a failure was where I really learned to do what I do now. And it was the beginning of not just selling books, because that's touring is a very hard way to sell books, but but of inspiring kids, of having, you know, teachers and students come back and tell you, you know, how suddenly these kids are writing and reading who weren't before, and and you know, talking about things like finding your magic and neurodiversity and, and how our differences are important. So that's sort of what got me into it in the first place. 
that is such a gospel principle of it's this unexpected way, this third way. And it looks like it's all is lost. You know, the, the Blake Snyder, you know, dark night of the soul, right? It's all is lost. And yet then it's this dawning of something new that you would not maybe have considered or thought was viable. And yet it really is part of your true calling. I want to talk about how you talk with these kids because most adults, I think, struggle to talk with middle grade kids. They they either try to talk down to them or try to be cool and buddy with them, right? It's just hard for them to just be genuine and for, for other kids to go, I, I can trust you. I know you. How, how do you do that? When you're going into these assemblies, you're going into these schools and you're teaching them, you're connecting with them. What's something that you have found that seems to be that magic that you connect with them? So I think the very first part is like, like you talked about talking up and down, the same thing with writing up and down. I have parents all the time that come and say to me, you know, the thing I love about your books is that I have kids who are reading above grade level, but I have to be really careful with like what content they're reading, you know, because they might be, you know, 10, 11, but they're reading at a much higher level. And, and they would say, you know, I feel like your books are really challenging. We can read them together and both enjoy them. But at the same time, like the content is age appropriate for a 10 or 11 year old. So that's the first thing is I don't want to write down or talk down to kids. And the second part is that I start really early on, like basically saying, hey, here's my book. Here's what it's about. And then I sort of back up and say, you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't diagnosed at the time, but I have ADHD. I had for three years, I had a patch over one eye and told all the kids in my first grade class that I was a pirate, you know, and, and I went to speech therapy. I've got pictures that I tried drawing at the time that like, I'm not an artist, you know, I've got one that I show them where it's like, my teacher like wrote ear next to the ear. Like if your teacher has to say, this is an ear, maybe you're not, you know, not going to be the next Picasso. Maybe you are, maybe you're just really creative. But then I discovered writing and discovered I like telling stories. And so I think kind of letting them go, okay, like this author, too many times, either the authors of the books they're reading are dead, like they're reading older books, or they view an author again. We talked about that kind of pedestal thing. I want them to go, oh, wow, an author is just like me. This is, this is someone who's published all of these books telling me that I can be an author too. And so that's, I try to go in with, with a, a big picture message, find your magic, change the world. Our differences are what make us great. You know, my talents can make a difference. And then for the, the teachers, I want sort of an, an educational leave behind. So we, we go over the four basic, how to come up with a great story idea in five minutes. That reminds me of Michael Ballin, who would go in and he'd do the opera, right? And he would show them how to use boxes and make them into scenery and things so that these kids are getting this hands-on, the teachers are getting the value and being able to take that back into the classroom and then helping these kids have an outlet. I don't know about you, but I'd love to know, how have you seen this impact these kids? Because there's so many times that kids nowadays, they're online, they're on games, they're not connecting, they're not expressing, they're not processing feelings. But here's this opportunity to learn how to write. And they don't even know that this is such a power tool for them to be able to do all of those things. What have you seen? You're exactly right. Like it really is powerful. An important part of when I talk to them about stories is, you know, I tell them, hey, when you tell your story, you're telling the rest of the world how you see things. And when someone who is different from you shares their story with you, they're telling you how they see things. And the more different voices we have sharing stories, the more we understand each other. And that's one of the things about readers and writers. I had an agent tell me one time, you don't meet very many writers or readers who are mean people because in order to 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 enjoy a book or or to write a story you have to be empathetic and so my kind of two goals are i want first of all i've met a lot of adults who view either reading or writing or both as work it's like i don't read unless it's something i have to do for work or you know maybe like a sports magazine or whatever but but reading and writing are not fun and so my goal is to come in and show kids 
that reading and writing can both be really fun, but they're also safe. You know, I tell them there, there is no wrong answer. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've had some somewhat questionable things that we come up with, you know, whether it's like, you know, a butt monster or a farting unicorn or whatever. But the thing is that, that once they know that, that there's no wrong answer, that it's not a right and wrong test, it changes things. So I've had teachers email me and say, you know, I had these two fourth grade boys who all school year, I've been trying to get them to write anything. And, and literally, I haven't gotten them to write more than a sentence. And after your assembly, they came up to me and they're like, we want to make a story about a farting chipmunk. And she said, you know, in the past, I would have been like, well, that's probably, you know, kind of inappropriate. But after your assembly, I was like, okay, go ahead and do that. And literally by the end of the day, they had put together a five page story. So that's kind of the first thing is, is it's not, people think middle grade is, is potty humor and, and it can be, you think like Captain Underpants or things, but most of those stories, you know, I mean, if you think of like the one and only Ivan or, or Wonder, there are so many really powerful middle grade stories. And the same thing with reading, the most like amazing experience in the world is having an 18 year old, you know, hulking guy come up to me and go, I know you don't remember me, but when I was in fifth grade or sixth grade, you came to my school, I hadn't read anything, but after your assembly, it was like, I think I wanna read that. And I finished that book and, and I told my mom, I'm like, I wanna read more. And I just wanted to come and thank you because it's because of you coming and visiting my school that I, I love reading now and that I've continued to read. And so we see a lot of those, but there's there's one more thing. Like I know I'm talking a lot here, but <laughs> so I had a dad come to me almost two years ago. I was doing a book signing and, and he was in line with his wife and his son, who was probably about mm, 13, 14. And he's kind of watching me like, you know, you'll be signing, but you're also kind of glancing up. And I noticed like an unusual expression on this dad. So he gets up to me and it was almost kind of like he was kind of choked up, you know, and he's like, your books have had such a powerful impact on me. And I was, I was expecting him to say like on my son, right? Cause he's there. And so I was like, tell me. And, and he said, so I was going through medical school, really struggling financially, you know, family, church, like all of these different struggles because of all this pressure. And my son and I discovered your Mysteries of Cove books. And we started reading them together. And it was your books that made me feel like I could succeed, like I could overcome these obstacles. And at the time, I was, I was like, well, thank you. I'm so glad that that helped. But I didn't really understand until I started reading studies where they've come back and they've said, okay, when you face an obstacle or a challenge or a difficult relationship, whatever, there are certain chemicals that are released in your brain. When you overcome those obstacles, when you solve those challenges, when you, when you make those relationships work, there is another chemical that's released. Well, when you read books about characters doing that, those same chemicals are released in your brain. And so what they found are that when people are struggling, if they can read about a character, even if it's not, you know, it's like, okay, these kids are building a mechanical dragon. I'm going to medical school. But those same chemicals get released, which is what makes people go, oh, okay, reading this book about a character overcoming obstacles suddenly makes my brain go, hey, you can do that too. And, and I think that, again, is, is another one of the powers of stories. Gorgeous, gorgeously said. So, so true. And I've seen that with each of my kids. None of them really wanted to read. And I'm like, are you from my loins? Like what? But once they got that book, that one book, that's all it took. One book is all it took, but that's it. And then they were on the road and they got that. I think you're right. That chemical hit that stayed with them in their cell memory, maybe that just said, this is good. I want to do this again. Love it. Now I have to in a podcast with you, we have to talk about your wife. We have to talk about this journey together. Can you tell us how was that for her to jump on board? Did she jump right on board and say, let's do this together? Or did it just sort of fall into place? 
And then you two become these two peas in a pod that has been this dynamic duo. It really is stunning the way that you two have worked this together. Can you share a little bit about that experience? Sure. Well, so I think one of the most important things, and again, we talk about sort of learning things. I don't know that either of us knew this early on, but I think that if you say, okay, like here's my family life and here is my other thing, whether it's a job, whether it's a hobby or whatever, if those are separate and and the job or the hobby grows into something bigger, then unless you have overlap there, it can very easily push out your family life. And you see a lot of people who have very successful careers in almost any field who end up, you know, losing their family basically because their family has gotten squeezed out by that. You see that a ton and you see that in writing, you see that in sports, you see that in in television, film, all that kind of thing. And so I think that right away, you need to find a way to overlap that. It doesn't mean that, that your spouse needs to write books with you or, you know, marketing and things, but you need to share that. It needs to be together so that so that you can both appreciate it and you can both enjoy that and do it together. So Jen and I have always loved, we just like being together. You know, like we always say, you know, we would rather be somewhere we hate together than somewhere we love apart. And so when I started writing, it was Jen who booked the tour. We traveled, we would set it up. In fact, I, I think my author friends, like they meet me first, but then they love my wife more, you know, and they're like, we all need a Jen, you know? So we we still we're on tour together we'll be in a hotel room and and I'll be I'll be editing or, or working on my next book or or just decompressing from the school visit and she'll be scheduling the next visits following up getting those done but it's because we like working together like it's not I don't feel like if it was the other way and she was writing I I would be totally happy and love to be the one who was booking the schools there and so that started early on I would bring her to all my conferences as I could. And, and she would immediately start chipping in. When we did our first Storymakers conference, the first one that I was in charge of, I was kind of complaining and saying, you know, we need sort of a real green room where authors can kind of close the doors. Like you're out in public. We need a place where you can just relax, you know, drink a soda, have snacks, <laughs> you know, like brush your teeth, whatever. The thing where you're kind of out of the way, right? And Jen goes, okay. What what do we need for that? And I started to tell her and she took it over to the point that like people would come to the green room because they loved her guacamole or they knew that like if they needed anything from a Band-Aid to, you know, dry shampoo to a USB drive that she had it in there. And so for years, Jen ran the green room while I was while I was out, you know, teaching classes and things. And then we'd get together. I think it really is important. Maybe part of it happened organically. Maybe part of it we planned. But I think that ultimately, whatever you do, the more you can have your family, your spouse involved, the more likely it is that you're not going to end up pushing one of the two of those out, that you've got that synchronicity. I love that. And so well said of finding the way to weave that in. Like you said, somebody doesn't have to be so fully involved in order to be connected and be supportive and feel like they're a part of that journey too, because then you'll miss all the deep experiences and and you have those opportunities to connect on that, celebrate, to commiserate, all the things. Love it. And speaking of that, for those that are listening, I've seen how invested you have been and what a huge help you've been in these conferences and organizations. For those that are listening, that are wanting to move forward in writing, I think you and I both know how important it is to get those mentors, to have that support, to be in a room full of people who are like, oh my gosh, they think like me and they talk like me. Wow, I belong here. What would be some good organizations that you would recommend or any way of finding mentors? I hear that from a lot of people. They're like, where do I find mentors? How do I get someone to help me? So I think the first thing that you want to start with, so we moved to Utah. You know, I mentioned that I was working for that tech company. We finally were in the process of selling it. My oldest child was going to be starting high school, and we both felt a real prompting to move to Utah at the time. And so we did. And 
as we, you know, had all the neighbors helping to unload the moving truck into our house, there was a woman across the street and she and I got to talking a little bit. I mentioned that I had, you know, a book that I, I had written that had just come out, my first book. And she said, oh, you should join our critique group. And again, I didn't, back when, when I started writing, you know, this was 2001 when my first book came out. So the internet wasn't what it is now. You didn't have the podcasts and the blogs and the authors, you know, not social media, almost none of that was there. And so you were kind of going, okay, how does this work? What should I do? Which is how story makers came together. You know, how League of Utah writers is basically you would find other writers. So she said, yeah, we've got this group. We meet once a week. We bring some pages, we critique. And and I was I was sort of a little overwhelmed by that, but we did it. Took me a couple of weeks to kind of get used to it, but eventually it worked really well. And with, I think, maybe two people who didn't end up really publishing a lot, the rest of the group, I think combined, we published close to 200 books. Heather Moore was part of that group, Annette Lyon, Michelle Holmes, Later on, Sarah Eden joined, Rob Wells joined. So I think that the first thing to start with is to find a group of like-minded people who can encourage you. And not so much people think, oh, well, it's like networking. You know, I know this person who has this agent. That's helpful. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have that. But I think it's one of those things where you work together, you encourage each other. And when one of you succeeds, you don't get like envious and be like, oh, they're the one. I mean, you do a little bit, but but mostly you're like, okay, well, this is a real person who just got an agent. If this person can get an agent or an editor and a publishing deal, I can too. So I think that's the first thing is find a group of other writers that you can meet in conferences. You can meet at League of Utah Writers. There's so many good things, but find a group of people that you can regularly write with who are they don't have to write the same genre, but you want kind of the same level, you know, like I don't, I, I'm not going to say, Hey, let me see if I can go get, you know, JK Rowling and Rick Ryder and Stephen King to like, you know, but at the same time, I want to be able to grow kind of with these people and stuff. So find people that are sort of at your level who are really committed to making their craft better. And then second of all, you're not going to be, no matter how talented you are, you're not going to be, you know, a best-selling author right out of the blocks. And you probably don't want to be because your your craft isn't there. It just reminded me my first story makers conference. I walked in and it was that seventh grade person in the cafeteria with your tray and like, I'm not awkward and looking for someone you might know, right? But acting like you're not. So I just went and sat down at the table that was kind of nearest to me that had some nice looking, you know, gals that looked like fun and, and perky. And I thought, I'll just sit down and say, does this seat taken? There was only one seat. I sat down. We ended up doing a writing group where I think it was four years all together. We went through all kinds of family things and all these different experiences and, and iterations and going back and forth. So it was therapy. It was connection. It was friendship. So just go and show up and be open. And I love how you said that. I know we're winding down our time. I swear I could talk to you forever. Just kind of wrap up with, has there been, you know, there's the ups and downs in the writing path. And has there been a moment that you were like, that's why I write. Maybe it was a connection you had with someone or an experience that you had at a book signing or with a book or, or maybe even with a publisher. But was there a moment that you went, that is one of those moments that shows that's why I do what I do? You know, I don't know that there was for me like one moment. It's like when people say, like, what is a book that changed your life? I'm like, I don't know that there's any one book, but but like books changed my life big time. And that's the same thing with me for writing, because I think people sort of, again, if you look at someone who, at least from the outside, appears to be pretty successful, it's like, okay, they've published multiple books, they've got publishers and agents, you sort of think that, that okay, well, that person's kind of got it made. It's like, you know, like having tenure, right? And, it, and it's not. The truth is that, that with very few exceptions, most authors are struggling all the time. Like, like they really are. I had a conversation with a bunch of what would be considered really successful authors. And we were talking about the fact that really, like we're not writing the next book to be the next bestseller, although that'd be great. You're, you're really like, okay, hopefully this book sells enough that I'll have the opportunity to write another book, you know? And so when it comes to that side of it, 
I've had lots of times where I've been like, okay, like I, I can't do this. You know, it, it, this didn't sell. I, I can't afford to do this or just that self-doubt, that imposter syndrome where you're like, I'm not good enough. But then you have the moments where you get an email or you get someone who comes up to you. And, and sometimes it's, it's because of a story you wrote. Sometimes it's because of a class you taught. I have a good friend of mine now who talks about the fact that she was in this writing conference and she went to this class and she had published a book which had sold really poorly. And I came out to talk to her and she went to talk to me and just burst into tears. And I just told her, look it, that is not on you. You wrote a story, a book that was good enough that publishers wanted to publish this. The fact that it didn't sell is not your fault. It's that the publisher or or the market or whatever just didn't work. But that's not on you. You need to not have that guilt. And it's really easy to feel that guilt. And then she came back later on and was like, you know, that that talk totally changed my life. Well, I think that's the thing about being a writer. Again, I was in the high tech field for a long time. I really started writing full time shortly before COVID. And I'm still not sure that that I'll be able to continue. I'm hoping that I will. I could throw that all aside, go right back into the tech field and make a lot more money, but without any of the satisfaction. And so I think number one, God gave me this talent for a reason, I believe. And whether I sell a million books or not, I need to use that talent. But at the same time, if I can affect lives, if I can get one more kid to read or one more author to have the confidence to continue writing or whatever, then that's that's what I want to do. Like that's, I, I, I'll just tell you one more story that I think for me was sort of a big deal. So when we when we sold our house and moved into this townhouse and, and kind of got over COVID enough that we could tour again, we met with our bishop and our stake president and said, hey, listen, for right now, you're not going to want to give us callings because we're going to be on the road a lot, a lot of the year. And both of them were like, well, so tell me what you're doing. And it was really funny that both of them said, I love that. Like, to me, that feels like you're calling right now, that that is what you guys are doing is just such an important thing that that's where God wants you to be. And, and I think that whether you're writing your first book or your 20th book or, or whether you're, you're selling a lot of books or not, whether you're touring or whatever, that I feel like you've been given that talent as a calling and magnifying your calling doesn't guarantee you you're going to make a lot of money or be famous or whatever, but it does guarantee that you're, you know, that you're taking those talents, right? And, and you're doing something with them. So gorgeously said, sorry, that teared me up a little bit. <laughs> I just, it's amen and amen. It's funny. The last question I was going to ask you is how the gospel has been woven into all this, how it drives this. And you just answered it beautifully. And I think for everyone listening, that is just the core, right? right of being called to create. That's why we call this podcast. You feel called to create. And you'll stay up till two in the morning or get up at two in the morning to write those books when no one's pushing you, but you feel compelled because there's something that the Lord has given you to be that medium for the spirit to reach other people in some way. And you're just another seed and you don't know when someone else is going to come along and sprout that in someone else. But that's the call to create, to create that environment, that opportunity, that moment. It absolutely is. And and I just like, if there is one thing that I could say, it's like, you wouldn't look at any other calling and you would say, oh, well, I'm not making enough money to justify the time that I'm taking away from this. Like we don't do that with painting. We don't do that with, you know, being a Sunday school teacher or whatever. We don't look and go, well, how is this paying me back? But for some reason in writing, we do that to our own detriment. Obviously, like we'd all love to be, you know, a a million dollar best-selling, you know, author and stuff. But ultimately, what it comes down to is I have this story in my heart and I'm going to try to get it out there. And then there are going to be some hearts that it doesn't connect with. And that's fine. But there's going to be at least a few 
where it connects heart to heart so directly that it changes people's lives. And that's what you have to lead with. You have to lead with, I'm doing this because I've been called to do it. And, and I wouldn't have been called to do it if it wasn't going to affect someone else. And then if money comes, great. Yay. It's great to be paid for that. But if it doesn't, don't, don't beat yourself up and go, oh, I'm a failure. Because that's not what callings are. And it's that one measure, right? That we're beating the one key on the piano of that yes. measure of success or fulfillment or I've done my job or whatever, or the Lord is pleased or it's accepted. Love, love, love. Oh, this has been absolute joy. Scott, thank you so much. Your life wisdom and experiences. Literally, I just wish we were sitting in pajamas <laughs> meal and with Jen and we could just go, go, go. We because would we would talk all day. We would we'd solve the problems of the world and then we'd write a story about it. It would be great. Okay. Where can people find you best who are sitting here thinking, I want to get his books. I want to find this for my son or my daughter, whatever. What's the best way to reach you? Um, okay, so my website is www.jscottsavage.com. All my social media, Facebook, um, Instagram, everything is all J. Scott Savage. We've got my newest book, Grayson Fox and the Treasurer Principal Red Beard, which is kind of a fifth grade Indiana Jones told in a film noir voice. That comes out March 7th. So we're going to be in Rigby, Idaho, Chandler, Arizona, at Barnes & Noble. And then we'll be doing just basically a week-long tour everywhere from Massachusetts, Georgia, Virginia, Texas, uh, New Mexico. So just kind of bouncing all around. And then the conferences we talked about, you know, I'll be at Storymakers. I'll be at writing and illustrating for young readers. I'll be at ANWAS or, you know, just shoot me an email and go, hey, I got a question. And he will answer it. That's what is just so lovely and joyful. Scott, you were just amazing and wonderful. Thank you for taking time with us today. Thank you so much, Connie. It was great. Thank you. And for those listening, you can check the show notes for more information on that. And if you love this interview, we encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe and go back to our other interviews. Season three has even more wonderful guests, just like Scott. We have Steve Young, Jay Clayson Johnson, Maui Bonner, so many people who are sharing their creative journey to help you on your journey of being called to create.